Um, I hope you all know me, some of you at least. Uh, topic of my uh, talk today, and however much I'll have to continue on Sunday, um, has got to do with the main to topic that we gave. Um, what's Sol and Victor's and the Zodiac, or Helios and the Zodiac doing on synagogue mosaic floors? But um, that's only part of it. I knew that may be a way to get you guys to watch. Um, Omanut Vedeot is what I call it. Um, it's a play on uh, Rapsadia Gaon's Emunot Vedeot. Uh, how do Chazal and the archaeological finds in general, not just the zodiacs, fit in with what we know and what we find? So in English, we'll call it arts and beliefs, the sages and the archaeological finds. Okay. So I assume you all recognize this and this. And let's go down a little more. And this. Except for a chastened tomb in Rechavia, where there's a couple of boats, basically the only art we see from the Chashmonai period is um, these type of images, fruit, plants, buildings, structures. Sorry for the quality of some of the um, things that I have here. Cups, uh, often the Shivat Aminim, the seven species the land of Israel is blessed with. Uh, but what's missing is people on the coins. That starts with Herod's sons. And the question is why? So you could say that it's simply because um, they weren't so from, they weren't so religious, they didn't care. Or it could be that they're um, um, to their merit. Perhaps they were so weak because Herod's kingdom was divided to the three and they were none of them particularly, how should we say, great, that um, the reason they did allow images of people onto the coins was um, perhaps out of fealty to the uh, Roman Empire. But let's just uh, go on. In 1918 in World War I, an artillery shell hit in the area of Na'aran. And in 1919, Vincent, who we know so well from your David, came, did a dig, and this is what they discovered. Who knows what it is? Correct, a mosaic with the zodiac. Not just the zodiac with Helios in the middle. How do I do that pointer thing? You see where I'm pointing? We see, but you can get a better point. How do I do that? Yep. Not sure how to do that laser thing. Right click. Do a right click. Right click. And then you have a choice of pointer. Can you see? Uh, no, I don't see it here. No, no, no. 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 If you're in PowerPoint, you see on the bottom left. mode. PowerPoint on the bottom left. And a number of different boxes come up in view. One of them is highlighter, pointer, pen, laser. Don't have that on the bottom. Maybe I have it on the top. No, because you're... you're... Sorry about that. You can do it uh, on the top. You see slideshows. So you press the slideshows. Ah, okay. And, uh, that's that's really uh, uh, from current slide, the, set, the, first, the second one. From current slide. And what do I do? You're Click there. on it. I did. Can I go to the bottom left? Uh, pointer options. Oh, that does it too. I'll try that. Does that work? No. 
Try again in the bottom was, uh, was arrow options, maybe there. You're looking for the pointer? I actually see it, but okay, it's very- that's fine, that's fine. You see it? You could just use your mouse, it's fine, we saw it. Okay. Now we don't all see right, it. All right. uh, but now I've, uh, I need to go back to my PowerPoint, how did that? Okay, hold on one second. You're in your PowerPoint. You can use your two arrows right and left. And then See that? Slide. The rays from Helios's head. Okay, we see it. It's fine. We just look right the wheels of the chariot. Can you, can you see you the make various sides of the zodiac? Now. Can you, make, can you make the picture full screen? You had it a minute ago, it was full screen. Oh, how do I do that? Hold you on did it a, a minute ago. Hold on, hold on, hold on. No. On the top, okay. Yeah, but then I don't see my uh, various pictures on the slide. So, so you can manage your, you can manage it. You can move it over. Move it, scroll your mouth, your mouse cursor over to it and it should open it up. Oops, how do I undo that? <laughs> <laughs> so just scroll through when you need another picture. It's okay. It's better if it's full screen. Okay, you see it now full screen. The problem is that I need to see, sometimes I might have to skip a picture or two, but okay. Um, one of the, there, there's a few interesting things here. You notice that there's a lot of iconographic uh, damage. Um, in other words, people erased the pictures of most of the things, but you can still see the writing, which is in Hebrew. For example, where am I? Over here, the game. And you see the fish, although they're erased. And uh, you can see over here Sartan. And if you look closely, it's actually a spider crab, which is native to that area, which would seem to imply at least that the artist. So this was found 1918, 19. It was dug up by Vincent. Didn't make much waves at the time. But then, next picture. In uh, 1929, uh, Sukenik digs up, we all know this one, Beit Alpha. And on the one hand, it had some very Jewish motifs. It had a picture of Akedat Yitzhak. It had the stuff at the top with the um, menorot and the shofar and the machta and the uh, lulav et rog. But uh, there you have uh, Helios or Sol Invictus on his four horse quadriga right in the middle. This did not have any iconoclasm, no damage, perfectly um, shaped and uh, formed mosaic. Not the best picture, but okay. Three years later, who recognizes where this is? Not the greatest of photos, but. Doiropus. Yes, Doiropus uh, up in uh, Syria. And this is often called frescoes. It's not frescoes, guys. Frescoes, the plaster is wet. Here the plaster was dry and it was brushed onto the dry plaster. It's a different technique. But what can you do? Everybody still calls them the Dura frescoes. And uh, just to go a little, uh, let's say, detailed, this is actually from the cover of uh, the book of uh, Stephen Fine. Um, the first time I glanced at it, and it was just a glance, I'm saying, what is Jesus doing on the top there, the guy with the halo? Till I really looked at it and realized, no, this is the guy holding a scroll. There's something behind him. But uh, according to most, this is uh, Moses. Um, matter of interpretation, there's a bunch of experts just on the Dura mosaic, um, frescoes or wall paintings. Uh, Gutmann, Weitzmann, Kessler, a few others, and um, they're not always sure what everything means. Guess what's on the ceiling at Dura? Little tiles, which include the zodiac. Okay, a lot of people don't know that. You don't see it in the pictures that we look at when we're at the Diaspora Museum. I see already 10 comments. Let me pause a minute.
Okay. Um, yeah, which mosaic is that? That's Na'aran, which is just uh, to the north of Jericho and a little bit uh, west. Um, okay, somebody's offering me more lessons on PowerPoint, but that's good. So it's not called stucco. It's brushed on wall painting. And um, I don't know if there's really a technical term. There's not a lot of it. Okay, seco paint. Okay, I'll accept that, Frankie, because you're an expert on this stuff. So it's really seco in that case. Okay, let's get out of the comments and let's go to the next pattern. This is from a Ktuva from the uh, 15th, 16th century. And uh, notice what we have over here. Pisces. And basically all around it are the signs of the Mazalot. Now, the uh, zodiac signs were used throughout the Middle Ages in artwork. Um, these are eliminated Jewish manuscripts, often in Mahzorim. And guess where they are in the Mahzorim? They're often in either um, Sukkot at the prayer for Geshem, or in Masorim for Pesach at the prayer for Tau, because the zodiac signs are mentioned therein. Okay, next. So this is from a book that you guys aren't going to get to, and I'm sorry for the quality of what it says here. But it's talking about the zodiacs in these manuscripts in the Middle Ages. And it says some specifically Jewish elements have developed in the zodiac illustrations, such as a bucket instead of the Aquarius. We have that in some of our zodiacs on the shul floors. In some cases, um, we'll skip down towards the bottom. Uh, in one machzor, 11 signs of the zodiac are depicted in a roundel, in the round format. Um, similar to the arrangements of the signs of the zodiac in fifth in, in mosaics of early synagogues. This example may be an indication of a tradition, traditional way of depicting the astronomical signs. Okay, so um, what happens in the beginning? Sukenic and others who wrote about the early finds are not bothered initially by all these depictions. And comes along Dura and raises the question, well, it's not just on a couple of mosaics. We have depictions of people and other things, um, signs of the Zodiac, definitely not so, so Jewish but especially in the middle of the mosaic at uh, Beit Alpha, we have Helios or Sol Invictus. Sol Invictus is the Roman name. Helios is the Greek name. A little hard to tell in some of them what they mean because it's pretty much the same thing. Okay. Now, a lot of the scholars who first dealt with all this uh, newfound stuff, whether it's Finsan, the original diggers at Dura Ropus, or, um, for lack of a better term, Protestants who couldn't imagine Jews with art. In the uh, 19th century, 20th century, Jews were referred to sometimes as the artless Jew. Why? Well, you see in front of you, and yes, the translation might not be the best translation. But basically, this is from Schmott. Let's go down to the next one. And you see various things that basically say, we don't do that sort of thing. We don't do idols, molten, molten gods, images, um, craftsmen, uh, and all that stuff. So, um, let's, before we get to this, so if we don't do that, um, the question is, and I want to get back to, we'll deal with that. Um, 
what was Judaism like as it moved from Beit Sheni and the Beit Sheni into the period till we get to the end during these mosaics. And remember the Dura is a century earlier. What were things like? So comes along Edwin Goodenough in the 1950s and 1960s. He writes a multi-volume book about, Jew, about all the archeology span and stuff that was found. And he says, all this pagan stuff, which we see here in um, Medusa over at Chorazim, all the different things, there were two groups of Jews. The majority of Jews were pagan, astrology, um, they had nothing to do with this little tiny group called the rabbis. And basically that's why there's all this art, all this stuff in the synagogues. What do we know from that period? So that's a good question. So let's go on to um, good enough, as I said, invents this mystical, magical, also magic, a lot of magic, um, jewelry. They're the majority. Rabbis are a tiny group with a few followers. And um, there's a guy named Moshe Her, who has a couple of wonderful articles. And at one point in his Hebrew article, when he summarizes what Good Enough says, he says, Ad kan divrei Good Enough, up to hear the words of Good Enough. Vehem begeder bad enough. And they're in the understanding of, or in the context of, bad enough. And he basically, uh, guys, you all know from Ir David and from other things that we call maximalists and minimalists. First of all, maximalists, how much was the population of Ir, of Ir David of Yerushalayim at the end of Bait Bishon with people like Faust and others saying about 30,000 minimalists with people, um, particularly out of, uh, if Barnea is here, out of Tel Aviv University School of Archaeology, my apologies, um, who say no more than 14,000. Um, we also have maximalists and minimalists when it comes to how do we date things in Bait Rishon with a discrepancy of between 70 and 150 years in that period of David Shlomo going onwards into the first kings. So, here we have that same situation. There's a whole group of scholars, starting of course, uh, good enough, Morton Smith Neusner, uh, and especially Seth Schwartz, who say, well, not quite as far as good enough, but the vast majority were these magical, mystical, zodiac astrology Jews, had nothing to do with the rabbis, and the rabbis had no influence over them whatsoever. There were basically two groups, almost like him. Those are referred to by uh, Hare as the extremists. Moving on to the more moderate, uh, he says there's what's called Goodman, Shia Cohen, and Lee Levine, um, or Levine. Uh, who I think that's uh, Asher's professor. Okay, now, non-revisionists basically say no. Jews were Jews and they were from, and let's look at some of the proofs for their part. Go to the caves of Bar Kokhba, which we all know so well, and we see that they cared about Sukkot and that they cared about all sorts of halachot and all sorts of um, Shabbat and practical things. And that's already in the second century. And using that and other proofs, he says, these guys were 100% from Jews, the majority. What exactly from was, he says, don't picture rabbis with payas 
and kapatas, and not necessarily were the rabbis anything to do with our type of rabbis today, in the sense that when we look at Orthodox rabbis, we get this certain picture. You can see from discussions in the Talmud that things were being formed in their thought with the differences of opinion and disagreements. So um, amongst the non-revisionists, the ones who say basically, yes, re religious Jews, Daniel and Josh Schwartz. Now Josh Schwartz is the older brother of Seth Schwartz. Seth Schwartz does a whole thesis that because Tiberius was independently run by Jews in the second, third century, and all the coins have paganism and emperors and stuff on them, therefore the Jews were basically pagan magical, as good enough says. And if that's the case, there's no surprise to see Helios, Sol Invictus, Zodiacs, Medusa, and all sorts of other things uh, centaurs uh, in synagogue mosaics. Okay, no big issue. Okay, I'm going to just check the chats for a second. Yes, Helios is the Greek sun god, Apollo or Saul is the Roman sun god, Saul Invictus, the sun god, will conquer. Yeah, or sun god, often seen in the fourth century, I'll, I'll get to this later, as um, there was a whole new concept called monotheistic pagans. Most of them were worshiping Sol Invictus as the Cosmo creator, as the creator of the universe. Okay, that's sort of said the, in, the invincible sun. Yes, okay. Um, okay, let's skip that and get, to, how do I get that out? Okay, just a minute. So, I want to get to something different. We have the, obviously, the various texts. I'm sure you all know them. No, that one. Um, if, um, so we've got these two schools of thought. What were the Jews like? Moshe Hur spends a lot of time digging in severely to Seth Schwartz, to these others, and basically saying, what are you talking about? Let's look at all the archaeological evidence of Jewish practice. And it shows that, yes, there were differences. There were Jews that were more secular, Jews that were more religious. And in a sense, he says, almost look like today, where you go to these Kivrei Tzadikim, and some of the people going in there are not necessarily just the way you'd expect people that are religious going to this type of thing, but all of a sudden, they sort of become religious when they go into these Kivrei Tzadikim. He points to a whole bunch of things. Now let's go to this text. So, um, before we get to this text, uh, welcome to read it at your leisure now. If everybody is uh, basically pagan and uh, into magic and into astrology, then you have to ask a question on their opinion. So why in all these shuls are there so many Jewish things, Jewish motifs? Obviously the top panel, the bottom panel, the biblical figures, we've got Daniel in the lion's den, we've got um, obviously the Akedah, we have all sorts of different, David HaMelech, uh, the recently discovered Shimshon mosaics, at Chukok, at Wadi um, Hamam, biblical figures. We have all sorts of biblical type scenes. So, um, if we have all this stuff, right, uh, if these guys are only into, uh, let's call it Avodazara, idolatry, um, what's the term often in the Talmud for idolatry? Of Deiko Chavimu Mazalot, Akko worshippers of stars and the zodiac signs. So that right away tells you, not exactly good these zodiacs, but at the same time, if they're doing all this sort of stuff, why are they putting Jewish motifs? We'll go one further. It's got to do a little bit with what Chana talked about, especially in the mosaic at Sipuri. Let me see if I can skip down to that. 
Oh, there's a lot of text here. But let's go down to Sipori. And uh, this section right here, we're going to mark it. We, oh, sorry, I didn't mark it that well. We all know that that section is reflecting a midrash, a talk in, uh, sorry, a Mishnah, uh, Bikur, sorry, Talmud, Bikurim, I think it's fourth paragraph, fifth Mishnah, something like that, uh, where you put the gosaloti pigeons on the side of the basket of Bikurim. Now that's not something you're going to come up with if you don't know Midrash, if you don't know that sort of thing. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Zev Weiss has an entire article about Midrashic influence, especially in Sipori's Mosaic, not just this, this over here, but other aspects as well in, um, of Midrashic influence. So if there's so much Midrashic influence, obviously these Jews knew Midrash, they couldn't have been so pagan, so into magic, that they had no idea what this was all about. Okay, so now let's go to the text that I had before, way up at the top. Ooh, a lot further, sorry. Okay, so let's start looking at what the, the sages say. This is a very famous one. We all love to quote it. Either when we go to the Chaman, the bathhouse in Akko, any of the bathhouses that we go to um, in all sorts of as, af, aspects. So you got Aphrodite at the bathhouse. He asked Rabban Gamliel what's going on, and he says, can't answer in the bathhouse. Okay, and then uh, he goes out and he says, I did not come within her limits, she came within my limits. Do not say, let us make a bath for Aphrodite, but rather Aphrodite has made an ornament for the bath. Furthermore, if you're giving a large sum of money and you enter into your idolatry naked, would you enter into your idolatry naked? Uh, urinate in front of her. She is standing by the drain where all the people are urinating in front of her. It is said only their gods. And this is where he goes, a whole Russia. That which does not get treated as a god is permitted. Seems very moderate. Okay, let's go to the next quote. Now when Shimon ben Lakish, Shimon ben Lakish was in Bostra. He saw Jews sprinkling water to this Aphrodite. In Bostra, by the way, it's in a bathhouse. He said to them, is it not forbidden? Notice that there's no answer. He came and asked Rav Yochanan. Rav Yochanan said to him in the name of Rav Shimon, the son of Yehud Zedek, that which is public property is not forbidden. A little bit unusual, a little hard to explain, but let's go on. Okay, and this is a famous one that we often quote. We could be quoting this in Katsreen where we have, or in the museum in Katsreen with Rabbi Abun's tombstone. We can be quoting this at almost any of the mosaics. Now, you notice it says it's a Geniza fragment from the Jerusalem Talmud. The first part of the quote, is in our editions of the Jerusalem Talmud. In the days of Rav Yochanan, this is the same Rav Yochanan, early fourth century, who said to him, it's okay that they did some sort of rite in front of the Aphrodite in the bath, bathhouse. Don't worry about it, in the previous quote. And he says uh, they were on the walls, they were doing art on walls, let's say um, exactly what we saw in Duroropus, and he did not stop them. Now this is a bad translation of a lo machi biadam. Lo machi biadam, he didn't rebuke him. In three, four cases in the Gemara where it says lo machi biadam, it basically means uh, it's not Asr, but in Yiddish we say it's Hasnisht. In other words, you shouldn't do it, but okay. 
It's not a hundred percent forbidden. In other words, that seems to say, well, grudgingly, it's okay. In one case, in Masechet Tuvot, no matli bi adam is seen as it's a hundred percent okay. No way to know what's meant in this context. Then you got the quote in the days of Rabbi Abun, and he was a little bit later in the fourth century. Um, they began or permitted to do mosaics, and he lo machi bi adam. He didn't stop them, or he approved, or grudging approval. And that's the question: What is it? Um, so let's go on. I'm sorry, the quality here is not very good, so I'm just going to skip this one. It's uh, two midrashim that basically talk about um, craftsmen. I'll go to this one on the bottom. Wait a minute, where's my uh, cursor? I don't see my cursor. There it is. We'll just mark it. Flesh and blood goes to a maker of images, Salamim, and says to him, make me a likeness of my father. He, the craftsman, says to him, bring me your father and place him before me, or bring me his picture, do you know, and I will make one like it, Katsurata. But he, in other words, Rabboni Shalom, who spoke and the world was created, is not. So it's talking about the artistic ability and the creation um, as opposed to artisans. However, um, underlying both of these Midrashim, it seems to be, hey, people had some sort of uh, artistry of their parents and would go to artisans. You notice that neither one of these seems to say, oh, that's not a good idea. On the other hand, we have this Midrash. So I know, again, the quality isn't that good, but I'll sort of read it. Uh, you shall not make a sculptured image, Exodus 24, that was one of the texts I brought you. One should not make one that is engraved, but perhaps one may make one that is solid, Scripture says, nor any likeness. One should not make a solid one, perhaps one, uh, one may plant something. You should not plant an Asherah. One should not plant something, but perhaps may make one out of wood, Scripture says, any kind of wood. And it goes on and on and on and basically says, uh, let's go down further. In the heavens, perhaps one may make an image of the sun, moon, stars, and planets. Scripture says Av above. So uh, I think you got the idea. I'm going to uh, check the chats for a minute because I see some stuff keeps popping up. Um, Where's the source about Rish Lakish in Bostra? I'll, I have it here somewhere, but if you want afterwards, I can send you all the sources. I have them written down. It's going to be a little hard to go searching for every single source. But I see that Judy answered in Sanava Dazara. Okay. Wow, that's impressive, Judy. Even I don't remember all my quotes. Uh, so you had it there. You wrote it. Oh, I did write it. Okay. It's not me. Huh, okay, sorry. Okay, let's go on. So where was I? Um, yes, okay. Um, this one. So it keeps going on and on and on. And this one seems to say that Chazal's approach to all of Adazara is very inflexible as opposed to what we saw with Rabban Gamliel at the bathhouse and with the bathhouse in Bostra. So let's go to another one. Rav Chia, son of Rabbi Abba, had a cup with the image of Taiki of Rome drawn on it. He came and asked the sages whether it was permitted. They said, since water runs down over it, the image, it is a form of nullification and therefore permitted. Now this doesn't really jive with what we see before. Okay. The palace of uh, uh, Bey Yanai Malka, the King Yanai, was in ruins. Gentiles came and set up a mercury there and worshipped it. Other Gentiles who did not worship mercury came and moved them and paved the roads and streets with them. Some sages refrained from walking on them, and some sages did not refrain. Said Rabbi Yochanan, our same Rabbi Yochanan as before, the son of the Holy Ones, 
walk on the floor. Shall we be, abstain? In other words, he basically says, not a problem. Uh, no, I want to skip that one. At the same time, uh, let's see somebody else we know often is flexible with stuff. Our famous Rabbi Abahu from Caesarea, who we know had no problem with your working to pay off your debts as a uh, um, an actor or worker in the theater. So here, Rav commanded the house of Rabbi Ach and Rabbi Ami uh, commanded his own households not to go to bow down as is customary when they go. Does it say to the synagogue? No. When they go on a fast day, Rav Yonah bowed sideways as said Rav Acha. Rav Shmuel said, I saw Rabbi Abahu bow down as usual. Rav Yossi said, I asked Rabbi Abahu, is it not, oh, sorry, is it not written, a figured stone you should not put in your land to bow down upon it? It should be solved by applying this first to the situation where one has a fixed place for bowing. Don't know how that solves it. But you notice Rabbi Abahu doesn't seem to have, again, much of a problem with mosaics on the floor and bowing down. And this is not exactly related, but it is a problem. Her rabbis taught, don't make a building with a shine and etc. In other words, they're basically saying, don't make anything that looks like, or too much like, a bet a mikdash. A table in place of the table of the showbread a menorah in place of the menorah, who on may make a menorah with five, six, or eight lamps. What do we find in every shul mosaic that we've looked at? Seven branch. But notice the next sentence, even other metals you should not make a menorah. That seems to imply the only problem would be with the menorah we found in Engedi that was an actual metal menorah. And that's getting to something else. Um, okay, this is this is from much later. I don't want to really get to this. Now, guys, I talked about Moshe Herr, and this is a loose, abridged translation made by me. He wrote two articles, one's in Hebrew, that comes much greater length than his English article. Uh, the article, I'm told that if I've got a background, I've got to hold it up right next to me, my face. Do you see it? It's found in Cathedra, and I think you can get it online. So, he writes like this, we can imagine a book 2,000 years from now about the Jews in the 2021st century. That's us, guys. These Jews were total pagans, and here's the proof. Most came to the synagogue for a short time once a year at sunset of Yom Kippur to sing a magical pagan prayer called Nidre. Now, by the way, Everything in this article is footnoted to the articles that prove that all these things. The night before, people sacrificed chickens to demons and waved them over their heads, otherwise known as kaparot. A week before that, many went to the ocean or rivers, sacrificing bed to the demons of the deep. At weddings, they broke a glass to frighten demons. They often married non-Jews. Even amongst those who didn't, there was a large sect who saw the Messiah as a dead Rebbe. The conclusion of the research, Judaism was pagan or syncretistic. So he says, every detail here is total truth, but nonetheless, it's clear that the final conclusion, conclusion isn't. I wanna to go to somebody, I wanna skip now for a moment, total skip in thought, to the 20th century to Rav Cook, hardly somebody you can say is uh, a product like Seth Schwartz coming out of JTS or Edwin Goodenough who's not Jewish and things like that. Uh, the whole large field of decoration, and this is my translation guys, it's really lousy. <coughs> Excuse me. The whole large field of decoration, embellishing beauty and drawing is permitted to Jews. Just one line, one sketch, what looks perhaps very long, but is only large in its quality, not in its quantity. It tells a lot of, it, of its spirituality, but very little does it damage the sculpture and the art. Despite all its great 
attributes. All the faces are permitted save the face of man. And he quotes the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah. There's a different version, by the way, that says you're not allowed to do the face of man. You're not allowed to do dragons. And I think there's one other thing, but I forget what it says. Okay, no man, no dragon. But basically everything else, this is very different than some of the other stuff. Right? How, and however, only the human face in a dimensional composition and whole. And even then there's a ways of wisdom to get assistance from a non-Jewish artist for the finishing touches of the special picture which, con which contains the prohibited. He goes on in the, in, uh, by the way, this is in Arad Raya, he goes on to say, but you can't draw paganism or Christian or, or Christian themes. Okay. Um, where is this? This is in a letter to Boris Schatz as he's starting the Batsala Art Academy. He wrote this to him. You can see from Schatz's answer, which we also have, that he had absolutely no clue he was such a secularized Jew. What the heck Rav Cook was talking about when it came to this? Any sort of Isra of Avodah Zarah, prohibition of Avodah Zarah. Basically, Rav Cook is extremely lenient. And you notice it says a dimensional composition. Does that mean, notice the painting behind me, those of you who can see it. It's done by a Hasidic Jewish artist who was quite popular here in Israel in the 1960s and 70s, Svi Rafaeli. The olive tree, by the way, it's in reverse for some reason, at least I'm seeing it in reverse. But the olive tree is extremely well done with the palette knife, very thick. I don't know if you can see, it's a picture of uh, the Temple Mount of Jerusalem. Okay, I moved aside so we can see that part. And uh, a beautiful thing. What if you did a face that way? Is that what he means by dimensional? A whole face? Or does it have to be only just a sculpture? Not clear, but let's go back to where I was. So, on the, remember I showed you that zodiac that comes from the medieval manuscript, and I told you there's lots of medieval Haggadahs and stuff that have zodiacs. So, Prophet Doran, one of the rabbis from the 5th century in Maaseya Fod, beautiful quote, contemplation and study of teasing forms, beautiful images, drawings, broadens, and stimulates the mind and strengthens its faculties. As, as with God, who wanted to beautify his holy place with gold, silver, jewelries, and precious stone, so it should be with his holy books. In other words, he says, great idea, all these illuminated manuscripts. Uh, if you want a really good book uh, on illuminated manuscripts, there's a whole bunch. I'll hold it up to my face. I hope you see it. This is one by Joseph Kutman, who, by the way, is one of the experts on the Dura Synagogue as well. On the other hand, in Regensburg, uh, Rav Yaakov and Moshe Alevi Mon uh, objected when somebody handed him the Maharil, when somebody handed him one of those decorated machsors. And then this is a, a great uh, additional text. In short, the dogmatic insistence that Judaism has always repudiated the image does not take into account the fact that there were frequent that there frequently exists a wide divergence between the verbalization of religious leaders in a particular society and the practices actually adhered to by large sections of uh, segments of their followers. In other words, even if you see art and these people do follow the rabbis, that doesn't mean that necessarily they had influence. Same holds true for Christianity as it does for Judaism. And we see this in art of the 4th, 5th, 6th century in Christian art, where it's often objected to in some way by church fathers, by other people that say, no, that's, that's not right, but it's there. Okay. I'm in the wrong area. Let's go up. No, I'm in the right area. Okay, we did that, we did that. We did Rav Cook, and we did Moshe here. So, um, and we're not talking about explanations as to what it is. 
Um, no, I don't want to talk about this yet. Let's go back to my notes. Okay. So there's two Jewish scholars, a guy's name is uh, Stern and Baumgarten, who are definitely in the category that Harris her, would call the non revisions And what they basically show again and again and again is that there's nothing in most of what the sages say, including some of those quotes that I brought you, they bring dozens more guys, I'm not gonna bring you every single quote, that shows uh, that everything is us or that's it, everything's prohibited. We'll leave it all aside. It shows basically a spectrum amongst the rabbis as to what's permissible, what isn't permissible with a lot of leniency. Baumgarten's whole thesis, or one of his theses, is especially Rabbi Yochanan, who we quoted quite a few times, was extremely lenient. Yet there's a quote that Rabbi Yochanan sent a guy into the bathhouse in Feria to destroy a bunch of images. He sent a non-Jew in. That might have a little, a little maybe connection to what Ruf Cook said later, but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> But he sent the non to in to destroy some images because apparently people were actually. talking. Okay. So I don't know per se what. Um, where was I? I lost my train of thought because of that interruption. Okay. Um, so what Van Gelden is saying that, yes, you see one case where he objected or had a problem, but apparently they worshiped those things. In cases where they're not really worshiping, they're doing some sort of sprinkling of water in front of the Aphrodite, um, or just that it's there and then reusing stones to walk on it, all sorts of things like that very lenient and he goes into that. So the first person to actually deal with the um, question from a halacha point of view is Professor Ephraim Elimelech Orbach, uh, father of uh, not Judy Orbach in, in Ephraim, Yossi Orbach who is our town's mohel or at least one of them. Um, Dr. Yossi Orbach, his father wrote a lot about Balai Tosafot but he also dealt with this issue. He said Paganism was on its wane. It was not that um, strong. This claim has been refuted later on, showing that it was still pretty strong, even in the fourth, fifth century. He said it had no attraction to the Jews. Along his lines, Sukhenik said, and Avi Ona, that basically all the art and show were just dec decorations, just you know, there for the sake of decoration. So let's go back up. Just a second. If they're there just for the sake of decoration, okay, one mosaic, two mosaics have um, zodiacs. However, so far we found at least uh, six, possibly more. The zodiacs. We found a lot of other, uh, and then not even mosaics. Like I say, at Duoropus they had zodiac. Other signs of zodiac in inscriptions and lintels of shuls. So if we have all of this um, zodiac stuff, it would seem to be that it's not just, okay, decoration. And especially when you take the Beit Alpha and the Tsipori, there seems almost to be almost some sort of program with the, let's call it the synagogue, uh, sorry, synagogue temple slash uh, tabernacle motif in the top panel, the Akedah down near the bottom, and the sign of the zodiac in the middle. And yes, at the uh, Hamat Feria, so the uh, Jewish motifs are off to the left side, and you don't have any biblical scene. Okay, so, um, sorry. So, you've got this, um, 
it, it's a little hard to say that this is random decoration um, because there seems to, maybe to be some sort of motif. Now, um, in the fourth century, which is when these mosaics start with, let's go down to it. Sorry, guys, got to skip through a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, in the fourth century, when you start to get to um, Hamat Veria, um, at that same fourth century, Constantine becomes Christian. Okay, cancel Nicaea, all that sort of stuff. What was Constantine still afterwards big into? Helios, or Sol Invictus, seen as Cosmo Creator, Cosmo Creator, the rise of what I call what is called monotheistic paganism. Coins, bathhouses, uh, had this image all over the place of not this image of the shul. There's the one from you. Yeah. There we go. One from Hamatveria. Do you guys see it? I hope you do. So the one from Hamatveria. Right. This is after we already had further, seems to already show, um, and this is an earlier one, fourth century, exactly the time when you have Helios on Roman coins, and this is the Roman Empire, is 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 basically becoming, if it hasn't totally become Christian. Um, yes, paganism still continues for quite a bit of time afterwards, but you've got this in the mosaic, it's a little hard to say that the people had no idea what it was or um, related to this in some other way. Okay, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Um, now, if you weren't Jewish and you came to this mosaic and you were told it's in a synagogue floor in the middle in a primary spot, and you see Helios over there, or Saul Invictus, and you see the whole image, and you see the signs of the zodiac, and you see the four seasons in the corners. You might say to yourself, there's something unusual, because that's not what I knew about Judaism. What are they trying to represent here? What's going on? So, I see it's already one o'clock. I'm only going to go on for a few more minutes. That's why there's a second part to this, guys. And yes, I know that I could probably go to 1.30, but I can't finish in that amount of time. So I'm just going to have to continue it. Um, but there's something a little troubling in this image. So I have, where is it? It should be um, a little further down, maybe. Sorry. Give me a second. Where's every, uh, there we go. So this is a blow up of the um, Saul or Helios in the fourth century mosaic from Hamatveria. Notice what's in his hand, a whip and a globe. So I didn't bring that quote. I'm sorry in my getting organized for this. I thought I had it in here and I don't see it in which the uh, Chazal, our sages said, um, can't make an image, and they go specifically into a listing, holding a globe, or I don't know, a globe, holding a ball, holding a scepter, the whip, any of the signs of deity. Notice the halo, which we do not have in any of the other depictions, the halo, or at least that we know of, around Helios Saul's head. These are all signs of, uh, according to our sages, of Odazara. So now's the question. Let's go back to something Ruff Cook said. He basically said three dimensional. This is two dimensional. 
And that's where you get to Stern. I, I mentioned his name before. Stern gives a whole thesis very well supported that the sages differentiated totally between statues, three-dimensional art, and this type of two-dimensional stuff that we have on floors. Two-dimensional on floors, they were much more lenient towards. You get that impression also from Rav Cook. So if you're much more uh, permissible, you can draw seven branch menorahs. You're not making one out of metal, like it said there, even if it's a different metal. In other words, that case there where it's prohibiting the menorah is obviously assuming you're doing it out of metal, not in a mosaic floor. Okay, so now let's, um, I wanna go up, away up. Where was I? Yes, okay. Just a little before the Yalko Shimoni. Okay, um, remember I talked about the Midrasha connection between mosaics. So this is brought by um, Zev Weiss. He brings this mosaic, he connects it to the Tzipori mosaic. I mean this Midrash, connects it to, in Tanchuma to the mosaic. Holy One said, when you sacrifice Shobed and you sow uh, and, uh, a little and reap plenty, but now you sow plenty and reap a little. And he goes into a whole bunch of the olive, uh, uh, since the libation ceased, libation ceased, the olive crop has failed. Since the oil is no longer used for lighting, etc., the sheep have vanished since daily offerings. Have, and by the way, he basically goes on to show basically everything in the Tsipori mosaic, all the pictures, all the animals, all the stuff, with the exception of wine. And there could be a reason for that. Is a reflection of this stuff that used to be in the Beit HaMikdash that we no longer have. Okay, so it's an interesting Midrash. I don't want this one right now. Let's go back, way back up. Yes. Its chariot is Argaman. That's the sun, which is set on high and rides on a chariot and illuminates the world. This accords with the text, the sun who is like a groom, coming from the chamber, etc. So, personification of the sun in Midrash literature, in uh, Bamidbar Rabbah, we all know the one, you know, based upon the Pasuk in Shira Shirim, right, in the Song of Songs. <coughs> That's what I just brought. A similar one in Pirkei the Rabbi Eliezer, the sun is riding on a chariot, and rises with the crown as a bridegroom. Okay, so what do most of us tour guides when we've got religious tourists or people that care about this sort of thing and saying, yeah, what's, what, what's the sun in the zodiac and especially Helios doing there? We recite this or quote from one of these and say, well, it's just um, their way of drawing the sun. Sun, the moon, the stars, um, signs of the zodiac. Now, um, what is particularly unique, let's go back, sorry to keep doing this, but we got to. There we go. What is part particularly unique about our mosaics? So throughout the Roman Empire, throughout calendars and all sorts of stuff in the fourth century, in the fifth century earlier, zodiacs. Almost never with Helios in the middle. Yes, there's a church in Bechan right near this that has Helios together with uh, one of the other idols, I forget which one, and she's in the middle with him without the four horse quadriga, without the stars and the moon. You have the four seasons. Okay. Only recently was a bathhouse in Northern Africa found that has almost all these elements. Okay, it's got the four seasons at the corner, the zodiac, but just Helios himself without the four horse quadriga, without the stars and the moon. Notice also if you go to Tsipori, in every single sign of the zodiac, there's a star. And I'm not gonna go all the way back down to that one. So 
we have this interesting concept that this seems to be a Jewish motif that keeps repeating. And the question is, what does this mean? What do the other parts of the panels mean? Should they be viewed as programmatic together? In other words, everything that's telling us something. Zev Weiss at Sipori is very big into that. That's part of what I'm gonna talk about the next time. I wanna just get to the um, discussion. Um, discussion, a whole bunch of chats I see since I last checked. Hold on. Why is it not uh, there? Chats. Okay, that's fine. Constantine's uh, pa uh, patron deity was Saul. While the sun became a motif in Christianity, the zodiac is not found in ancient churches. No, nope. it is found in ancient churches. In, um, like I say, you will find it in some. That's incorrect, uh, Huey. It has been found in, in some. Not very often, and it was often, and, and that's usually 4th, 5th century. And uh, like I said, you do find Helios right there in the church, same time period as um, this mosaic in nearby Becha. Um, okay, uh, that's about it over here in the chats. So with this, I'm going to end because obviously I haven't answered. Is there a program? Is it there a program? What might so I'll be doing in these mosaics. I see there's one more chat. Uh, but basically, um, no, I don't see it. Okay. See, I'm going to say goodbye. See, this was very good, very enlightening. Um, I think um, if you're going to have a number of quotes from various sources, it's Mishnahic sources or whatever, maybe if you can send them out to us in advance so that we have them in front of us, because for me, when you spoke about them, it went very fast. It was hard to keep it together for me a little bit. And okay. I want to go back and I want to review each of them. So, because um, I find that they're... Okay, they're, what I'll do... to have when we go guiding. Okay, what I'm going to do is send all the ones that are here in this um, PowerPoint as an email to Israel guides. It okay. won't be on the WhatsApp. And now uh, the next part is going to be go into the theories as to what is being represented. Is something being represented? And then I'm going to give you a new theory. Actually, two new theories. Um, okay, wait a minute. Hold on, I see some things coming in, so let's go. Um, okay. uh, in which churches was the Zodiac found, Zodiac found not in biblical lands? That's correct. Uh, you do find it on an official calendar from about 350-something, um, put out by the Roman Empire. And um, I forget the name of the calendar, but it is maybe not in an actual church. Oh, correct. I'm just answering questions. Um, yes, I do have a new theory, but that's, uh, or a different theory, an additional theory. And I see all the thank yous are coming in. So thank you for listening. And uh, we'll try and finish this up on Sunday. This worth the show. Bye. All right. Svi, thank you very much. Um, I just welcome. want to add, thank you, Judy, for note. hosting. Thank you. I just want to make a note that I recall it's not there anymore, but at the great uh, Yeshiva Hagadola in Meir Sharim, inside their their Beit Midrash, they had a zodiac on the ceiling, um, and that that was incredible. In Yeshiva University's main building, which was built, if I'm not mistaken, late 1920s, early 1930s, right in the entrance hall on the floor still there last i checked but i haven't yes, been but covered by a, covered by a uh, rug so you shouldn't see it what 
Since the 1990s, it's been covered by a rug, so you shouldn't see it, but it's still they there. They put a rug. Somebody took away the rug. The rug was put back. There's a nice, beautiful, inlaid metal uh, Zodiac in the floor no at Helios, Yeshiva though. University. But no Helios. Yeah. But in the 20th century, it's not as surprising as it is in antiquity. Um, so is it surprising or is it not surprising? Um, I got a little bit into the concept of uh, what were the Jews like back then. We'll be continuing that as we view the uh, mosaics, uh, and I start talking more about it on Sunday. I would, I'd also like to mention that you might want to talk about other things, which beyond the zodiacs, the nudity, the other types of depictions, which yes, might be there's any... nudity in some of them. There's nudity, not nudity in others. Uh, I'm going to mention something just very briefly now, just as a food for thought. Um, in lots of churches and in several synagogues, there's a vine. Think of the mosaic at Nirim. Uh, uh, Ma'on, Nirim, a vine motif going around with stuff in the middle. In all the churches, there's also people in the middle. In the synagogues, there's only animals or inanimate objects. Okay, just a little something to think about um, towards our, our next discussion. So yeah, okay, I see a few more chats. It's probably all saying goodbye. There's a great thing on the internet about somebody saying goodbye on a, on a Zoom chat, but it goes on for about 10 minutes. Um, great information. Was the YU Zodiac to be meant to be representative of Beethoven or something? Nope, no, just representative of the Zodiac. As I showed you throughout the Middle Ages, where I didn't really show you too many pictures, Zodiac keeps repeating, in Ktuvot, in Machsorim, okay? You know what, there's one more picture I'm going to show you guys. Uh, some of you may have signed that. I'll show it again at the next one. Whoops, it's the other direction. Yes, we're going in the right direction. One more picture. Uh, actually, two. Let's go. There they are. This is front page of Eitanach, early Middle Ages. We're talking about 12th, 13th mm -hmm. century. This is front page of a different Tanach. Okay, or the same one, but also. What does this sort of like strike you as coming from? So a whole bunch of uh, scholars say, you know those mosaic floors that have the menorah and have the machta and have other, um, and uh, remember, at least in Sipori, we have the showbread done differently. Right, so here we got our showbread. I'm not very good at this. Um, so it's a holdover. In other words, the tradition just continued. They kept doing the zodiacs. They kept doing this stuff. And this is a holdover from what they had on Shul Mosaics. The tradition continued. So we'll talk a lot more next week. I'm saying goodbye. How do I do that? There's a way to, first of all, I stop the share. Uh, wait, wait a second. Before you say goodbye. Okay. Wait, before you say goodbye, uh, I just wanted to ask you a question about the, 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 the mosaic floor at Beit Alpha. That yeah. from the, that's from the 6th century, and a lot of the examples that you were talking about before are, and a lot of the qu quotes were referring to 3rd, 4th century. Was there uh, a difference in, you know, in the way the Jews behaved or whatever, or the culture, etc., from the third, fourth century to the sixth century? Part of next week's uh, talk. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Today, thank bye you bye. very much, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us.